Good morning. It is Wednesday morning on the ninth day of February. What a beautiful day. And uh, we almost got sun poking out this morning. It wasn't like the other day that it was so foggy out. Good morning, Miss Carolyn. Good to see you out there this morning. And Miss Terry, I love your I loves. And Miss Ruth, good morning to all. Good morning to you. Miss Cynthia and Dale and Ryan, God bless. And there's our buddy. Good morning from sunny Atlanta. Well, we got a little bit poking out here, too, so uh, we can say almost sunny Portland. So, hey, buddy, Julia, love you. There's Miss Sherry. Good morning. Thank you all for sharing your sunshine with me today. And Miss Sue, God bless. It is good to see those that have popped in and signed in, and I see we have many more than that out there. So, if you have a if you have a sense you'd like to do that, just go ahead and, and type your name out there or put a little note out there and pop it up there. We would love to be able to acknowledge that you are there as well. Kind of like doing that in the morning. It's fun. It is. Uh, well, let's launch in. We've got a lot to cover uh, today as we move in. And, and uh, so open your Bibles to the 19th chapter of Revelation. That's where we're going to be uh, uh, into next week as well. After we finished uh, with uh, the complete and total destruction of both the wicked uh, religious system of Babylon in chapter 17 and the evil political economic Babylon in chapter 18, uh, there is a call to rejoice over their judgment. Let me get the let me get the keynote up there, and we will. Uh, Forward. There we go. All right. It says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment on her. Uh, then after the last of those judgments, we come down to uh, uh, really the very next thing that has to happen in the chronological order of things will be the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, we immediately are, uh, after, after a fall, comes this loud sound from heaven begins a series of hallelujah courses. Now that begins in chapter 1 of the 19th chapter. As we look, the very next thing now is, is going to be the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and that final battle. A bunch of stuff in here related to it. This is going to reinitiate, if you will, the chronological order of things within the book of Revelation. One verses one through three says, After these things, seven and eighteen, 
after these things, uh, well, and, and not only 1718, but go back to the pouring out of the last uh, bull wrath in, in 16. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. And the second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. This series of choruses can be considered a uh, hal el uh, of the book of Revelation. In fact, many uh, interpreters, many scholars, theologians, that's what they call it, is the, is, is the Hallel section of the book of Revelation. Now, Hallel, if you remember right from yesterday's study, is the name that is applied specifically to uh, uh, Psalms 113 through 118, where they had a special role in the Feast of the Passover. Most Jewish sources associate the Hallel with the destruction of the wicked exactly as this passage in Revelation does. In fact, it lifts up and quotes directly out of the Hallel. These psalms were what Jesus and his disciples uh, would have sang at least portions of them after the Passover celebration before going out on the Mount of Olives the night before his death. So as we begin today, I thought it would be neat to begin with the words of, of at least part of the Hallel. So if you would like to, you can uh, put a marker in your Bible where you are and flip back to Psalms 113 and listen to this and see if this does not sound a bit like what we have been looking at. All right, Psalms 113 begins, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to the setting, uh, to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and, and, and on earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and with the princes of the people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord, who is like the Lord our God. Let's pray. God, it is good to take time this morning and lift up these words of praise and adoration, acknowledging with those of old that uh, you are worthy of all our praise. And who is like the Lord, our God, who raises the poor from the very ash heaps and sets them on high, along with the princes. Oh God, how great and how glorious is our God. We come this morning before you acknowledging your greatness, acknowledging your wonder, acknowledging your absolute sovereign authority over all in our life and in the in, in, in the life of the world and, and the peoples of the world in general. You are holy, high and lifted up. You are seated upon your throne, and this earth, Lord, is your footstool. And we, your servants, humble ourselves before you and exalt the mighty gloriousness of your name. Now, God, I pray as we come into your word today, that you will, will unlock its truths to our heart and our minds. Let us come into a deeper, more wondrous understanding of who you are. God, grant us the wisdom to see and understand your word and to apply it to our lives and to our culture, to our world. 
Lord calls us this day to truly be salt and truly be light in the midst of this dark and, and wicked world. Use the words of this servant and, and these servants who are co-laborers together to unlock the wonder of Christ within the lives and to the lives of those that do not yet know you. God, draw people to you like a magnet draws iron. Lord, lift them up out of the ash heap of sin. Clothe them in those beautiful robes of righteousness and sit them, Lord, with you in the glorious heavenly places where, Lord, our life is hid with God in Christ. And here on this earth now we await your coming again, Lord, with anticipation. Thank you, Father. Give us these moments together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want us to begin by looking at the content of their praise. Uh, all right, in, in verses 1 through 3, again, look at those words. It says, After these things I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and his and, 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 and his judgments are righteous. You see, that was go together. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And the second time, they all said hallelujah, and her smoke rises up forever. The first aspect of praise consists with a declaration that salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And notice that it is that the hour in our God means that those giving praise had rejected the God of this world and his false Messiah and by faith had accepted the Lord as their God and as their Savior. For this many had died a martyr's death, but to their God, who is, by the way, our God, uh, through Jesus Christ, belong all true deliverance, glory, and power it belongs to him. We share in it, we rejoice in it, for he is our God, the God of our salvation. The apparent successes and victories of the enemies of God over his people were just purely temporal, did not last. And why do they make such a statement? Well, this is given to us in verse 2, because his judgments are true and righteous. God's perfect, holy character, his perfect righteousness, his perfect justice cannot act unfairly or unjustly. It would be against his nature. It would be denying himself. And he says in, in the word, he cannot do that. He has perfect knowledge, absolutely omniscient. It isn't like a court of law in our day where we go in and we get even at the best partial truth. We don't have perfect knowledge of, of, of anything. We come to render judgments, but we render it with the best information we have. But with God, he has perfect knowledge. So there's never an error or a mistake in the judgments that he makes. And therefore, he has all the facts so that all of his judgments are in accordance with truth. There is no hearsay evidence in the court of God. It's all firsthand understanding. In this case, the ground of God's judgment demonstrated in the fall of Babylon was the immorality by which the great harlot had seduced and corrupted the earth. A further reason for the righteousness of God's judgment is that he does not allow his people to suffer unjustly under the harlot. Those who died and those who suffered greatly will be avenged. He'll not let that go unavenged. In fact, he will pay back. Well, remember what Paul says in quoting, uh, you know, uh, the, song, the vengeance is mine. Do not pay back evil for evil. For you remember, the Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, thus saith the Lord. He will avenge the wrong that was done to them. And by the way, he'll avenge the wrong that has been done, done to the people of God from, from the very beginning and on forward. Sometimes in this age it appears that there's no justice. But this cannot and it will not always be the case because of the character of God 
Now, the word avenge suggests a, a complete rendering of justice to avenge his people. I thank you for letting me get a sip of old rye this morning. In verse 3, we have the second hallelujah. And is given in connection with the statement that her smoke rises up forever and ever as it speaks of uh, the destruction of Babylon. The smoke may refer to the smoke of her burning that, that we see in, in chapter 18 and, and, and verse 9 as well. And verse 18, and results in, in her destruction and her eternal punishment. In chapter, nine, chapter 18, verse 9 and verse 18, discuss the, the smoldering, smoking, burning of, uh, of evil Babylon. Whichever this guarantees that her punishment will be permanent and absolute. She will rise no more. And then all of a sudden, there's, there's, there's some that join in on this chorus. We have the hallelujah of the 24 elders and the four living creatures around the throne. Upon hearing the hallelujahs of this great multitude, the 24 elders and the four living creatures respond with their own hallelujah and worship to God. In verse 4, it says, And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen. <laughs> so be it. Hallelujah. Praise unto God. Please don't the cause, and, and, and they worshiped God, who is seated on the throne. We need to capture this picture of our God, who sits on the throne, enthroned even above the circle of the earth. This strongly, strongly emphasizes the permanent sovereignty of God. There is no act of man nor of nations. There are no problems which comes up in our life which overrules the sovereignty of God. You may be out there going through difficult times. I know some of you are. You may know others or people in your family that are going through horrible and horrific times. This has been kind of a transformative couple of years, has it not? And the world may mandate much to us. But none of that overrides the sovereignty of our God. Psalms 103 and verse 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. By the word, that word established simply means that it is permanently forever fixed and will not move. So his sovereignty is for all ages. God, with his great power and steadfast love for us, sets permanently enthroned in heaven. And as the one who sits on the throne of heaven, we ought to humbly submit to him and give him the very throne of our hearts. He is sovereign, absolutely. You see, again, this is the reason that one of the greatest keystones that we have for our life is the sovereignty of God. And the more weight that you will put upon the sovereignty of God in your life, the stronger and more unmovable your life in Christ will be. The more stable you will be in the times of crisis. You know, one of the neat things that, 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 that we find in instructions during an earthquake is that you run and get in a doorway basically get in an archway because that's a that's a that's a solid strong point within any dwelling and when the earth moves around you you get under that arch there's a measure of protection for you well when you get under the arch that has the sovereignty of god as the keystone then i have to tell you your life is secure no matter what winds or tribulations or earth-shaking things can happen to you your life will be unmoved because you're under the sovereignty of God. Even death cannot shake that. God with his great power and steadfast love sets permanently enthroned. But too often we're like the world. We want to usurp God's right to rule. But when we do, it will always measure up to our loss. 
It never works out the way we hope that it'll work out. But I got to tell you, when God is sovereign over the very throne of your life, he sets enthroned in your life. Come what may, whatever happens, you come out on the bright side. How do you think that the martyrs throughout the ages have been able to suffer under the hand of persecution and even horrific death? Because like Stephen, they looked up and saw their God enthroned on the throne of heaven. Well, then we come to the final hallelujah of this great multitude. Immediately in response to this picture of God enthroned in the hallelujahs and the worship of these creatures of, of, of God, a voice comes out from the throne. And then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Verse 6, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like a roar of rushing water, like standing next to the Niagara or right under Multnomah Falls, this roar of rushing waters, like a loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. There's a reverberation of that word in, in the syntax. Hallelujah, 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 for our Lord God Almighty reigns. His voice is not the Father, it's not the Son, but only uh, an angel because of the phrase, our God, in the next line. It is this great and mighty multitude raising up their voice in such a crescendo that it's deafening. Our God. The voice says, praise our God. In other words, sing hallelujah. That's why there's this uh, this reverberation. We could just keep going on hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Who is to respond? All of his bondservants. Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Note that in this statement, all social and economic distinctions are transcended and removed in worship of God by his people. Before God and in Christ, all believers as the blood-bought possession of the Lord Jesus Christ, are his bondservants. We are those who should have a true reverence for God through our illumination in Christ and by our equality together in him. In Christ there is neither bond nor slave, bondman or, 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 or freeman. There's not a slave or a master, a male or a female. All are equal before God. No race barriers, no ethnicity. We are all one in the Lord. In order to express the majesty of this praise, verse 6 describes this voice as a roar of rushing waters like the sound, uh, like, like a loud peal of thunder. It is a majestic expression of praise from the heart and the mouth of the saints of God. Then the last hallelujah states, for our Lord God reign, Almighty reigns. In other words, truly, he is still on the throne. He has not been shaken. He always has been. He always be, will be. But the primary emphasis in this context is that God is now dramatically establishing his reign upon the earth by the previous judgments and especially by the, by the return of the Lord, which will be announced shortly. Now, the very next vision that John sees is the announcement of the marriage supper of the Lamb. I know that it's something that we've all heard and we're going to be looking at that. 
in chapter 19 verses the last part of verse 6 and into verse 9 it says hallelujah for the lord god almighty reigns let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. This fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Now following the invitation of the saints to the married supper, John moves on to the to, to the next vision of Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, riding on a white horse, coming to assert his dominion and finally defeating his enemy, the beast, the false prophet, and begin what is known to us as the millennial reign. Now this period will cover a thousand years where Jesus will reign as king on the earth, setting upon a throne established, while the devil is bound and unable to see, uh, deceive. Now, this will be discussed later in the next chapter, in chapter 20. Though theologians debate greatly when the marriage supper will take place in the timeline of events, they generally agree uh, to its significance as one of the key moments in God's plan. It's highlighted here. It's a celebration of faith made sight reunion and fulfillment of promise. It is a time of glorious celebration of, uh, of, of wonder and, and, uh, and joy. Now, now listen, we're not going to deviate from this, but we're going to fill in what I believe are some very important gaps that are here because this is a significant event in the life of, 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 of all of us, and it will be. It's upcoming. And like I said, theologians debate this issue uh, of what it is, when it is. Uh, some people uh, hold the idea that the marriage supper, generally the, the marriage feast in, in Jewish tradition would last seven, uh, seven days you know, a week. And uh, you know, so some hold that the marriage supper is going to be conducted during uh, that that period of the tribulation, from the rapture to the return of Christ. <coughs> I uh, I was taught that. <coughs> Excuse me. As a kid growing up, that's kind of the the overall flavor of uh, of the teaching of, of the time, at least in the church that I attended as a child, as a kid. But I want to come back and, and look at this more systematically, if we could. I wrestled with this. In fact, I was sharing with Sherry yesterday, the night before last, all of this was all put together. And, and it just kept playing through all the study, everything that I read, everything, and, and how best to approach this and teach on this subject. And uh, so, you know, out of that restless night come what I'm going to be sharing with you. Uh, in a way to present to you what I, what I have come to truly believe in the study of, of, of Scripture. This isn't a new epiphany or a new revelation, but it's one I've never taught, no, or or you know anything in any detail. So the first thing I want us to do is is identify <coughs> the bride, <coughs> though. This is a much debated topic, believe it or not, among theologians of, of, of all stripes. I'd like to take an approach that I believe to be consistent with the whole counsel of God. There are some theologians that believe that the bride of Christ is strictly the church that comes out of the church age that are gathered together from the time of... Uh, of uh, Pentecost until the rapture. That's the bride of Christ. There are others that believe the bride to be uh, Israel, uh, national, physical, you know, Israel, and those Jewish believers, you know, that that come to believe uh, throughout the ages or 
you know, in the tribulation, because it relates to, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down as a bride adorned for her husband. So they say that relates to strictly Israel. Therefore, Israel is the bride because in the Old Testament, Israel is considered the bride throughout the Old Testament. So that's the bride. And, and the debate rages on. But I do want to give you something that I think is consistent with what we've been studying and with the whole counsel of God. First of all, I would like to say that I truly believe the church is the bride of Christ. The church consists of all who have been called out of this world, both from physical Israel, that would be <coughs> include the Jews, and from the Gentiles. It is from these two that one new man is created. Remember Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 19. He says, Therefore remember that formerly you the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants and promises, having no hope, and without God <coughs> in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that he himself might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Now, move on to verse 16. And might reconcile them, uh, uh, them both into one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are there. Peace to the Gentile and peace to the Jew. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then we are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So we see that the church is made up of two distinct classifications of people. Jews and Gentiles, those who are far off and those who are near all brought together and peace made by the blood of the cross. He brought the two together and made one new man, speaking of the church. Once a person repents, whether they're Jew or Gentile, they put their faith, his or her, into Christ, <coughs> receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit to guarantee the assurance of God. They become members of the body. They become members of the church, of which Jesus Christ is the head. But notice this incredible statement that the Apostle Paul makes when he writes to the members of the local church in Corinth. In his second letter, in the 11th chapter, second verse, he says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you a, as a pure virgin. Now, he's drawing us a parable. He's drawing in the, you know, into our remembrance a parable, the parable, if you will, of the ten virgins. You remember five were, were, were waiting and, and uh, prepared, five were not. They were all betrothed, but you could say uh, those who, who were waiting in anticipation in preparation were ready when the bridegroom came. He's liking this to the church now. Here we see a unique, the unique relationship the church also referred to, you know, well, if you will, in Galatians 6 and verses 15 and 16, there is neither circumcision, neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, this does not speak of the physical Israel only. 
but also of the spiritual Israel, which is made up of believing Jews and believing Gentiles, or rather all who have trusted with the same faith as Abraham, whose faith was in the promised seed. Remember, we've already looked at that on a, on a Wednesday night. In Galatians 3, in verses 6 to 9, it says, it says, Even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore be sure that it is those who are in faith, of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Who are the true sons of Abraham now? Those who believe in Messiah, even as, faith, as Abraham believed and trusted God, it was counted to him as righteousness. The scripture, verse 8 says, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So those who are in Christ by faith are the church and are the betrothed of Christ engaged to be married to him. Now you know that the betrothal period, the same, the same weight of marriage was on the betrothed. Though that marriage had not been consummated, and we're going to look at the phases of, of a Jewish marriage a wedding ceremony you know, getting in tomorrow. But understand, under that betrothal, there was supposed to be the same kind of fidelity as there would be a marriage for both the male and the female. For those who are in Christ by faith, we are the church, and we are the betrothed of Christ engaged to be married to him. Paul's words. Then Paul paints this same picture, does he not, in Ephesians 5, when he tells the husband to love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her? And then he says to the wives, submit, your, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, let the wives be subject to their own husband and everything. The picture is the church is the, the wife, the bride, if you will, and Christ is the groom or the husband. Now, John paints that very same picture, John the Baptist, in John chapter 3, if you want to go back and look at it. So the church is the bride of Christ. But I contend also that believing Israel, those Old Testament saints, believing Israel is the bride. This would include the Old Testament saints that were faithful and trusted in the promise that was yet to come, the promise of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They were just as blood bought through that sacrificial system and the faith that they put in what it pointed to as you and I are blood-bought. Of these Old Testament saints, the writer of the book of Hebrews says in chapter 11 and verses 13 through 16, all these died how? In faith. And Abraham is listed in that list of them, is it not? And we, are, we have come into a relationship with Christ through the faith like Abraham's. We believe, and it was counted to us as righteousness. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on this earth, for those who say such things make it clear they are seeking a country, they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been think, uh, thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he is what? Prepared a city for them. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I come again, I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Though God had betrothed himself to Israel, Israel had played the harlot and rejected her husband until God is said to have divorced himself from her. Remember, at the time that this happens, Israel is one country, Judah is another. In Jeremiah chapter 3, and in verses 8 through 10, it says, I saw that for all the adulteries and uh, of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and give her a writ of divorce 
and her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and also played the harlot. Because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet, in spite of all this, her treacherous city, Jerusalem, did, Jerusalem, Judah, did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. Now, this is, to me, one of those most incredibly mysterious verses in the Old Testament. It would appear that God divorced Israel for her unfaithfulness and immoral acts and adulterous ways. By all right, God could and should have done the same to Judah because of her behavior. It was identical to that of Israel, even if it was slightly a little slower. However, in his long-suffering patience, God instead called his adulterous wife to return and be restored. But God who is ever faithful to his covenant, gives us a great, wonderful story of redemption and restoration in the story of the prophet Hosea and his prostitute wife, Gomer. In the end, now you know the story, they have three children, one is my own, one may be my own, one is not my own, is their names. She leaves him, she goes off to play the harlot. She is, at one point, found on the auction block, being saved, sold as a prostitute slave. Now, notice these prophecies. Paul is, <coughs> excuse me, in the air. Hosea chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. And I shall be in that day, says the Lord. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband, and I no longer, and, and no longer call me my master, for I will take from her mouth the names of Baal, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. Then when you fast forward to the end of Hosea, in chapter 19, it says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Verse 23, Then I will say to those who were my people, You are my people, and they shall say, You are my God. Now, though that can extend to us on one level, you cannot get away from the significance that this is extended to Israel. God's promise is to restore an apostate Israel to that place of honor, and once again call her his bride. Now, we know do we not, that that's something that's going to happen during Jacob's trouble, as Jeremiah names it, or the tribulation. But along the way, as Paul has already said, there were many, even in the Old Testament, that were believers by faith. You have Daniel, Ezekiel, we go through a whole litany of them, can we not? And Isaiah 54, verses 4 and 5 says this, For you will forget the shame of your youth, for your Maker is your husband, and the Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, and he is called the God of the whole earth. Now we know who Isaiah was writing to, do we not? So those who are blood-bought children of God during the period between the resurrection, or really the, the Pentecost, and the rapture, as well as those Old Testament saints who trusted in the promises to come, and the restored, blood-bought Israel who will turn to Christ as Messiah during the time of Jacob's trouble make up the bride. But third, I believe, and this is where a lot of scholars, they, they don't believe this, they, they don't accept it, they, they, you know, and that's because of the timing and positioning of the, the marriage supper that they hold on to, but I believe that the tribulation saints are the bride. In Revelation 7 and verse 14 gives us a clear picture of those who believe during the tribulation period. It says of them, Then one of the elders answered, saying, Those who are clothed in white robes, who are, who are they, and where they come from? 
And I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he sits on his throne and will spread his tabernacle over them. Now, stop here just for a minute. This is an incredible, beautiful picture of a significant event in the traditional Hebrew wedding event. We're going to look at it more when we get to the phases of, of, of a Jewish wedding, because I think this is all built around that, that you know, understanding that, that John has. When the bridegroom came to give, comes to get the bride with his entourage, she leaves her house and comes, and there's a tabernacle that is spread out, held up by those, and the bride and groom come in under the tabernacle and go out to the wedding and the wedding feast. So I, I don't think there's a mistake. I don't think it's a coincidence that this imagery and this picture is in here. And folks, I have gotten so carried away on this. Oh, I, I need to finish it. I pray if, if, if you can't stay with me for the next couple of minutes, that's fine. But pick this up because it is important. In verse 16, it says that they will hunger no longer, nor thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. These saints, many who have been martyred for their faith in Christ, will believe and be part of that great company that make up the full bride. All right? So what do we have? We have those blood-bought children of God during the church age, you and I. Okay? We have Old Testament saints who trusted in the promises of God, Abraham and, and Isaac, and you go on down. I believe even to people like Nebuchadnezzar that we've already studied and looked at. I believe that the uh, redeemed Israel of the tribulation, those Jews who come out, that 144,000, and that, that remnant of Jews that are saved during the tribulation, and I believe that those tribulation saints, Gentiles, all make up the bride. Now, with that as background, I believe uh, to truly grasp the significance and meaning of this passage, it's going to be helpful to explain the marriage custom in John's day, which was in three phases, the betrothal, the presentation, and the marriage feast. We'll get to that tomorrow. Thank you for giving me just that extra couple of minutes. I would have hated to leave that without finishing it, and I did lose a little track of time. I am sorry for that. I tried to be very faithful to time. I just kind of got carried away. But I pray that brings some clarity to the concept of who is the Bride of Christ. Every blood-bought individual of faith, from the beginning of time, that Christ is brought under that umbrella as his own. Father, I thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for the position that you have given us in your kingdom. Thank you that you spent your blood and broken body to redeem us from the very ashes of sin. God, now bless this day as we go out. Fill our hearts full of wonder because of the wonder of our God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Our God reigns. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Thank you so very much for being a part this morning. I pray that you got a lot out of it. I threw a lot at you. You ponder it. You think about it. You have questions, ask. If there's any responses, please. If you disagree, that's okay. That's okay. I'd love to hear where, where you stand on this subject as well. This is where I come from, from many, 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 many hours of study over a very long period of time. God bless you. I'll see you tonight at 6 for our study and our prayer time this evening. And we're going to be back here picking up on the, the, the phases of, of the Jewish wedding ritual that, that John would have been familiar with tomorrow morning at 9. God bless you.